One day during the final summer, a team of doctors came in from Berlin. They were in the midst of a grand experiment which they considered to be of the utmost importance, and needed access to a large number of prisoners. Something beyond what they could acquire in Berlin. We protested that we were not equipped for any sort of medical experiments that our camp was designed for a single purpose. But they insisted, and we were forced to accommodate them. I was immediately irritated by their senior doctor, a haughty man in his late forties named Engel, who always wore a crisp white coat and fine leather shoes. He arrived with his team of doctors, and I could scarcely believe it. A Jew. This was, perhaps, the ugliest Jew to have ever personally offended my eyes. He was a very tall man, a full head taller than average, with a furry black beard, a gnarled, claw-like nose, and very prominent eyes. These eyes were something of a source of fascination to me, though, as they were not the rat-like black color of the normal Jew but a much lighter shade of brown, almost like bronze. He wore a shabby suit and followed Engel around quite closely, almost as if they were associates. And always his strange, flashing eyes were roaming about in a suspicious way. When I first met Engel, I asked who this Jew was, but my question was brushed aside. They immediately set about converting one of our buildings into a station for their experiments, the details of which were kept from me entirely, and his team made no contact with the other staff except to demand various supplies. After a few days of being subjected to Engel's imperious behavior, I could feel that my SS subordinates and even the Ukrainians were smirking at me behind my back. So I decided to give Engel a tour of the other part of the camp, which he had not seen yet. The part where we process prisoners. Of course he refused, but I insisted. Fortunately, a trainload of prisoners was arriving at that moment, and we went out to the platform. The odious Jew with glittering eyes followed us, which pleased me all the more. The train arrived with the cries of its passengers, blending into the squealing of the metal wheels. The blue units worked themselves into their usual frenzy, pulling the passengers out, shouting and clubbing and herding them towards the main gate. Amidst the crush of passengers, the limb bodies of children occasionally came spilling out onto the platform, and the blue units tossed them into a pile. Engel watched all of this impassively. A woman came out of the train, clutching a child of perhaps three years. She looked about, frantically, screaming for a doctor. I gave her a sympathetic look and held out my arms. She approached me, the handsome, stolid-looking authority figure that I am. I took the child from her and tenderly examined it. It was still alive. I placed it gently on the ground and used my boot to reshape its skull. The woman I shot. Rachel does not dream. Rachel does not sleep. Rachel does not wake. Rachel feels. All the time. Rachel Head has a direct sense feed with Reinhardt Emotive FPS blending for stunning clarity and total sensory presence. With the entire culinary library at her fingertips, Rachel can put herself into any scenario and create precision mixes at speed of mind. Watch as she blends Beethoven's Fifth Symphony with the Asteroid Orbital Catalog, the 2018 World Cup game, and the new hot anal coming video from Angelica Alenia. What mastery! See the subtle crafting and non-stuttering blends? That's because Reinhardt's proprietary technology blend splits 240 visual FPS on the fly to create an eye-popping visual stream of over 1,000 FPS, while simultaneously delivering 60 tactical FPS and 60 olfactory FPS. Now this is salvation. But hey, forget the specs. Check out the feelings. Her Holocaust child victim torso muscle thumps have walls around the world, shedding tears and making those real feels. 
You can't fake this stuff. Are you tired of distant, deadening emotions? Reinhardt Emotive FPS Blending gives you realistic immersive feelings without excess rumination or thought linger. This kind of subtlety just isn't possible at ordinary 240 FPS. That's the difference for Rachel. That can be the difference for you. Rachel does not dream. Rachel does not sleep. Rachel does not live. Rachel does not die. Rachel feels. Can you? After a week at the camp, Dr. Engel put in a rather perverse request. He wanted to move his laboratory to the old gas chamber. I had no problem with this. We had installed a new, more efficient gas chamber with the help of an expert on the matter. And although they had a capacity of over 20,000 a day, we were seldom ever able to process more than 15,000 in a single day due to the unreliability of the trains, which were often slow enough to preemptively process many of their passengers for us. At this point, we had orders to cremate the bodies, and they burned in open pits day and night. And we warned Dr. Engel that the old gas chamber would be a rather distracting environment to work in, as it was between the smoke of the burning pits and the noise of the new gas chamber. He disregarded this, and his team moved in that day. After that, I rarely saw him, as that part of the camp was somewhat hidden from the rest, and my headaches, which were growing more severe, had always made me reluctant to visit. Soon, my men began to tell me strange tales from the new laboratory. Nobody except Engel and his men was allowed inside, but we surmised that he had removed or reduced the chamber's interior walls and sealed up all doors except one. He requested his own SS detail and two guards were posted at the door at all times. A steady flow of prisoners went into the laboratory whom Engel selected with the help of his odious Jew assistant, often to the great irritation of my units, as their fussy selectivity often slowed down our processing activities. Nobody could make any sense of his selection process, as it mainly consisted of the Jew looking the person over and making various mutterings. It was reported that every few days an enormous package wrapped in tarpaulin would be removed from the laboratory and carried over to a special burning pit which they had made. These packages tended to bleed, leaving a trail of blood to the burning pit, where they were burned under the watch of Engel's personal guard. This behavior was only extraordinary in that there was no need for secrecy when it came to killing prisoners. Thousands were being killed every day just a few meters away in the new gas chambers. Between this and the inexplicable presence of the Jew assistant, I slowly became curious about their project. My men, however, were unable to get any information about what was occurring inside the laboratory. So I decided to focus a few questions on the member of the team who presumably had the least sense of loyalty, the Jew. On one of our days off, I found the Jew in our little zoo, admiring the peacocks he looked very much at peace while he watched the birds strut around, while I was suffering from a vicious headache. I began to talk to him, affecting an offhand, friendly manner. His German was perfect. I asked him about his background. He told me he had been a religious student in Berlin until he was expelled to a ghetto in Krakow. I asked him how he had met Engel. This is when he told me something quite surprising. This was actually his second time coming to Treblinka. On his first visit, he was on the very verge of being shot when somebody had noticed his perfect German accent. Apparently there had been a request for prisoners who spoke excellent German, and this earned him a reprieve. He was sent back to Berlin, where Engel performed tests on him. I asked about the nature of these tests. At this, he became more reticent. He had been instructed to discuss nothing with me. I merely informed him that I would shoot him through the face if he didn't tell me everything. At this, he showed no fear. 
but looked at me with his odd, brazen eyes and gave me an almost pitying smile. He said that the doctors were testing a new Swiss invention, some kind of chemical which was administered orally and caused profound changes in thinking. I asked him about these changes. He said that the chemical allowed him to see the mind of God. Naturally, I asked for elaboration. At this, he launched into a rather overworked smile involving a broken mirror and switched to another smile using a spider's web, neither of which made any sense to me. I informed him that I was a practical man and had little use for philosophy. He told me that after taking the chemical many times, he had become possessed of two minds, his own and that of God. In all his doings, he was conscious of God's intentions, of God's plan for all human life. I asked him if he was following God's plan, and he said he was not following it entirely. I am wrestling with God, he said cryptically. How does one wrestle with God? Isn't he all-powerful? He replied, when God presses forward, you must yield or be destroyed. And when God yields, you must press forward. That sounds more like dancing than wrestling or making love, I said with a snort. He smiled. Yes, it is, except that dancing is not so painful. Why wrestle at all? If God is God, and you know his plan, why not simply follow it? Surely this is the best course. Yes, but I cannot bring myself to, he said. For the first time, I saw the peaceful expression flee from his face to be replaced by an unsettling dread that trembled in his eyes. God's plan is simply too awful. Imagine Mother Babylon, Mother Rome, Mother America. The world enslaved, flesh networks spanning the globe, the blood of humanity moving through veins thousands of miles long, cavernous curving tubes as big as superhighways, biological superstructures, bones the size of the Golden Gate Bridge, living engineering, hearts as big as mountains, pumping with tectonic force, chained in relays, moving blood across continents, exotic neurochemical pestilence flowing from monstrous glandular ridges, flesh encased nightmares, farms of non-human tongues babbling blasphemous gibberish, a vast sea bed dotted with lonely eyes, this is the great queendom of Babylon, a great blood-drunk whore wearing the crown of the atom. As all around her fleshy carapace float orbital platforms of nuclear death, scattered in the stars beyond, the seeds of Israel weep to gaze upon their new mother, the undying queen of blood and corruption. The worst thing a black man can do is go to church on Sunday. We're not supposed to do that. In the old days, before Jesus paid for our sins, we'd be put to death for idolatry. But now you see them all dressed up in their suits, and the girls are in their dresses with their booty all hanging out. They got the coochie hanging out of the dress. At church. They're going in there like it's a club. That's not what God wants. He wants us to dress modestly, because we are God's chosen people. But they don't know this. They're eating crabs and shrimp. Shrimp platters going to Red Lobster. All you can eat shrimp $9.99. They don't follow the law. Then they go into church and worship this picture of white Jesus. That's idolatry. That picture of Jesus with the long, soft hair, the good hair, that's not Jesus. That's actually a man named Cesar Borgia. The real Jesus had curly hair, 
black hair. Because he was black. He was a Jew. You have to understand what's going on in the world. Right now they have satellites in space. And they have weapon systems. Atom bombs. Everything. And which way are they pointed? They're not pointed down here on Earth. They're pointed out into space. Why? Because the nations of the world, America, the UN, they're all waiting for something to come from space. Watch. It's coming. And they're going to try to destroy it. The Battle of Jehoshaphat. See, there is a thread, a line through history. The Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Romans, America, the slave owners, it's all one. Do you know who the Nephilim are? They're mentioned in the Bible, but only twice. You have to understand the mystery of the Bible to understand what they are. The first time they get mentioned is in the story of the Flood. It says in Genesis 6-4, There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. These giants were Nephilim. Nephilim is the original Hebrew word in the Torah. You have to understand Hebrew to know the mystery of the Bible. Nephilim are the children of the sons of God, who are fallen angels. Angels came down and had sex with human women, and they gave birth to Nephilim, people who were half man and half angel. The angels looked down, saw the people, the original man, the black woman, the nice bodies, the nice booties, the thick legs, and they all got them a piece of that. I'm serious. They said, we angels, we can do what we want. So they got some. A little later in Genesis 6:12, it says, And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me. For the earth is filled with violence, and through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. That is how the flood came about, all this mixing of flesh. Now what if I told you the children of the Nephilim are still among us, that they are renowned, as the scriptures say, that our scientists, our bankers, our leaders, our inventors, our Nephilim, Bill Gates, Albert Einstein, Steve Jobs, these men are part fallen angel, and they are corrupting the flesh, like the Bible says, by doing all this gene splicing and mixing chromosomes, because they're made from mixed flesh, between angel and human. So they're all for everybody mixing, men with men, girls and girls, whatever. Pretty soon, you're gonna see chicks with two heads walking down the street, and we're supposed to say it's cool. I won't say no more because I don't want to get banned. The Nephilim control the internet. I'll just say I seen it myself. I've seen how they mix the flesh, experiments, the government, making new things. It's out there. In the training curriculum for becoming a readjustment specialist, they emit finger blasting entirely, which is odd considering what a routine part of the job it is. I can't tell you how many times I've been in the middle of a conversation with a client only to have her slip her finger into her shorts and start diddling away. My clients, long-term session heads, i.e. people who have been connected to a direct sense feed for multi-year spans, are practically feral. Even though the feeds are supposed to be all about empathy and social connection, everything is so mediated that they lose the capacity for normal social interaction. If their session begins at an early enough age or goes on long enough, Shit gets truly weird. The readjustment client is a stimulus addict. They crave easy, immediate stimulation. Some turn to drug use, but they usually require near lethal or outright lethal amounts to properly stimulate themselves. Others turn to masturbation. 
The readjustment client has no patience. If they are uncomfortable, they want immediate relief. If that entails an indiscreet bout of onanism, then so be it. Almost all my clients are women. The female clients tend to choose male specialists, and the male clients tend to choose female specialists. In the feeds, they often surround themselves with coteries of admirers of the opposite sex, so they insist on opposite sex specialists. This is an unhealthy impulse, but we must meet our clients halfway. Our job is to slowly transition them away from being fake adoration sponges and being functioning adults. I am not a doctor. I am not a therapist. I am trained to think of myself as a paid big brother. Perhaps there is an inherent contradiction. I must be stern without being overly judgmental. I must be empathetic but effective. I can't coddle them. The feed coddles them. That must end. The work could be described as Sisyphean, trying to reculture a person after years of all that whiz-bang feed simulation is like pushing a heavy boulder up a hill. And occasionally, the boulder is masturbating. I asked the Jew exactly what sort of procedures they were performing in their laboratory, but at this point we were interrupted by several members of Dr. Engel's team, and they hurriedly ushered him away. Although there were still many unanswered questions, my curiosity was largely satisfied. They were testing a new chemical, and probably performing vivisections and such to ascertain its physical effects. Perhaps the bodies were burned separately because they require special handling due to the presence of the chemical. There was nothing especially sinister in that. It was actually rather considerate of them. That night, shortly before I was about to retire for the day, one of the Ukrainians came to me with a small package wrapped in cloth, about the size of a loaf of bread with an irregular shape. He was very excited. He unwrapped the package, and inside was a fragment of pale white bone, an extremely unusual fragment. It was a sort of rounded carapace, like a part of a giant skull, but with five round holes in it, much like eye sockets, but obviously too numerous to be so. Studded throughout the fragment were extrusions that looked like molar teeth. Looking at it, I could not place it as part of any animal I had ever seen. I asked the man where he got it, and he said he had retrieved it from near the laboratory's cremation pit, just an hour before. The piece itself did not appear to have been burned, as it had the meaty stink of death about it. I asked him a few more questions, but he knew little else. Still. He insisted that the bone fragment was from something monstrous and unnatural which they were creating in their laboratory, and that I should shut down their experiments. One of my SS subordinates immediately set to thrashing the Ukrainian with a baton for presuming to advise me on my duties. And with that, the conversation came to its natural conclusion. I took the fragment with me and spent a while turning it over in the dim lamplight of my quarters. It was indeed otherworldly, and, as the Ukrainian had said with a kind of wild fear in his eyes, it was truly monstrous. Despite the Ukrainian's impudence, I decided to take his advice. This had all gone too far. Whatever the high command might say, I mustn't let this camp be overrun by secretive madness, but must maintain a spirit of rational cooperation. I would insist on full inspection of the laboratory first thing tomorrow morning. I lay down to sleep, and was soon visited with a dream so intense that I did not feel like I was sleeping at first. At first, the bed in which I lay seemed to rise up from the floor, and flowed ever upwards through a large, glowing tunnel which was painted with all manner of designs. From paisley to topographical lines to various kinds of calligraphy, in unknown languages. After this, the dream became a series of absurd images 
ever changing and blending into new images and shapes. Many of these shifts struck me as clever or absurd, and I found myself laughing maniacally at it all. Finally, all these desperate images appeared at once before me and began to rotate around each other as part of a fantastic wheel. And slowly, I began to suspect that by combining them all, some sort of grand secret would be revealed. Just as this notion occurred to me, all the images began to coalesce into one final image of stunning clarity. It was the image of a woman, or something which was mainly a woman, but also different creatures, who was vastly large and seemed to tower over me, miles in the sky, who looked down on me and filled me in human eyes. Her skin was inhumanly pale, but she wore a crown of exquisite thorned flowers, and blood ran in shimmering red streams down her skin. She was pregnant, vastly pregnant, with a stomach so swollen it was like she sat upon a huge mountain of distended flesh. I could sense within her belly there was a hive of activity of something or many things pulsing and squirming feverishly. Soon, the belly burst open like a ripe fruit, and rivers of blood poured out, and a revolting mass of fleshy tubes came spilling out, unraveling and tearing open to set free hundreds and thousands of monstrous infants, who were both human and not human, who had the same filmy eyes as their mother who were slathered and dripping with blood.